Mathieu da Costa is widely believed to be the first black man to set foot in Canada, but is there any evidence to support this claim? Given the level of adulation surrounding the man and his status as one of the founding fathers, you would think there was a wealth of documentation about his life, but you would be wrong. In fact, the truth about this highly revered and enigmatic figure will surprise you. In the first decade of the 17th century, the French merchant and explorer Pierre de Gardemont was given a mandate by King Henri IV of France to colonise lands in North America. The king's decree also granted Dugois a monopoly in the fair trade, on the condition that he brought at least 60 settlers to the colonies each year. With the financial backing of wealthy merchants in France, Dugas chartered a vessel for an expedition, and in June of 1604 he set sail across the Atlantic, with the aim of establishing a colony somewhere along the St. Lawrence River. In addition to this, it was hoped that strong trade alliances could be made with the indigenous inhabitants of the region. It was for this reason that Matthew de Costa, a free black man fluent in the native Algonquian and Mi'kmaq languages, was recruited for the expedition. There is, however, a major problem with this well-established narrative. A serious lack of evidence. Much has been written about Matthew de Costa over the years the majority of which can only be described as historical fiction. A simple Google search will bring up a multitude of highly romanticised stories and unfalsifiable claims. According to one website, Matthew da Costa was a black Ladino Moorish Jew of Iberian origin. A remarkable claim considering the only primary source that makes mention of da Costa would take up little more than a footnote in a history textbook. The curators of his Wikipedia bio take this embellishment a step further, providing the date of birth is March 1st, 1589, and even state Quebec is the location of his death. Given the fact we can't even be sure he ever actually made it across the Atlantic, these are astonishingly bold claims, as you will soon discover. Everything we know about Matthew da Costa come from the records of a long and bitter legal case that ran from 1609 to 1619, a case so fundamental to Matthew de Costa's story that had it not occurred, we would have no knowledge of his existence at all. The details of this case are extremely fragmentary, but can be summarised as follows. On February 2nd, 1607, the States General of the Seven United Provinces of the Netherlands received a letter from King Henri IV of France, complaining that a ship called the White Lion, which was equipped for warfare, had entered Canadian waters and landed in New France, a country that had been discovered and settled by a previous French monarch over a hundred years earlier. The White Lion had looted two trading vessels belonging to the King's Lieutenant General, Pierre de Gardemont, taking their guns, mounts and munitions and had also seized the fears of the native people. The king demanded restitution and asked the States General to protect French merchants and to dissuade the Dutch from trading in the region. The Dutch States General passed the king's letter on to the Admiralty of Amsterdam, asking for advice on how to proceed in relation to the French king's demands. The Admiralty replied on the 19th of February 1607, assuring the king that the seized items would be returned to the Mont in due course. However, the city of Amsterdam did not agree to give up the freedom of the seas for the sake of the French king, as it would severely impede Holland's commercial freedom. This response from the Dutch Republic would have serious implications for de Gaulle's operation. The trading monopoly granted him by the king was effectively annulled. But Pierre de Guardemont's legal battle did not end there. Not satisfied by the outcome and the substantial losses he incurred, he sent his secretary and lawyer, Jean Ralliot, to Amsterdam to launch a lawsuit that would go on for a decade. Ralliot was accompanied to the hearing at The Hague by Mathieu de Costa, who was presented in court documents using a racial slur as an interpreter in the services of the Company of Dumont. 
The record also states that Da Costa had signed a contract of employment to act as an interpreter for De Gua in a future voyage. The contract was signed in 1608, just prior to the lawsuit, and was to take effect in 1609. The details are a little vague, but at some point during the early stages of the case, Da Costa had severed ties with his French employer after being enticed by a rival Dutch enterprise. The signed agreement between Da Costa and Duga is often used as evidence in support of Da Costa's presence during the 1604 expedition, in which the first permanent French Canadian settlement was established. But as was stated in the court papers, this contract was signed in 1608, four years later. In an attempt to solve this timescale issue and keep Da Costa in the nation's founding story, some have suggested that Matthew da Costa may have been part of a 1608 expedition in which Dugas enlisted Samuel de Champlain to establish a new French colony. However, this theory can easily be dismissed. Records confirm that da Costa was in Rouen that year, charged with what are described as insolences, and imprisoned at Le Havre in December 1609. Now that we have gone over the key events surrounding Mathieu de Costa's life, we can see that the scarcity of evidence places a considerable amount of doubt on the officially adopted story. The question remains as to why. Why have historical accuracy and academic integrity been abandoned in the case of this particular historical figure? If we take a cursory glance at the current geopolitical landscape in America and across continental Europe, we can probably draw a few general conclusions. Western nations are currently undergoing a national identity crisis. Decades of globalization and relatively free movements of people have caused a seismic shift in population demographics. As a consequence, governments are having to continually rethink their policies to reflect these changes. History is one area that's been given a lot of focus. It's incredibly difficult to have a functioning society when the history of a sizable portion of that society is rooted on another continent. It's even more problematic when that history has a troubled past with the host nation. In an admirable effort to strengthen cultural cohesion and to put right to past wrongs, history is being reimagined. But instead of simply presenting the unfiltered truth, warts and all, Many countries are opting for an inclusive approach, which in many cases involves the distorting or even outright fabricating of facts. Matthew da Costa's story falls somewhere in between. So to summarize and wrap everything up, these are the facts we know about Matthew da Costa according to available historical records. Matthew da Costa was employed by Europeans, both French and Dutch, to act as a translator on North American expeditions. However, a lengthy legal dispute between the French and Dutch, a prison sentence in Le Havre, and a signed contract of employment cast doubt on whether he actually made it to Canada during the crucial dates in question, or if he left mainland Europe at all. Despite several authors going to print, there are no records of his birth, his death, or his country of origin. One thing that is for certain, is the level of importance placed upon him due to his linguistic abilities that are alluded to throughout. Despite the majority of artist impressions depicting a purely sub-Saharan African man, the records indicate that he was more likely of a mixed ethnicity. If we can momentarily set aside our yearning for certainty, a difficult task for any historian, we may be able to propose a variety of possibilities but until other documents surface, that's about the best we can do. In terms of Mathieu de Costa's legacy, his story is firmly enshrined in Canadian history, and the enthusiasm surrounding his mythos is only likely to grow stronger. There are books, movie adaptations, day tours, street and school names, and even a national postage stamp that all bear his name. Not to mention a parliamentary bill proposal to designate an official Matthew da Costa Day. As the old saying goes, don't let the truth get in the way of a good story, and the story of Matthew da Costa is certainly that. 
So what are your thoughts? Have I got it wrong about Matthew da Costa? I'm certainly open to having my mind changed if anyone has any support and evidence. Leave a comment down below. And if you enjoyed this video, then please like and share it to help grow the channel. Until next time, Maximus out.